Hello, I'm Dr. Jennifer Jackson. I'm a registered nurse and assistant professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Calgary. And this is Quantitative Research Designs Part 2. So we're going to pick up from my previous video, which was in Part 1, where we talked about an overview of general concepts that apply broadly to different types of quantitative studies. Now we're gonna look at specific different types of quantitative studies and the sort of unique flavors that each type brings forward. So the test of whether my share screen here works. There we go. I'm also going to tack on this. There's one more general principle that my, my slides let me down a little bit. And given that I do not have Steven Spielberg level video editing, I'm not even going to try and clip it onto the previous video. So this is just one other broad consideration about quantitative research before we get into the specific design. One thing that you'll see is talk about samples. So with quantitative studies, we tend to have samples that are larger numbers. Now, larger numbers means different things in different contexts. If you're looking at a randomized control trial where you're doing an experiment, experiment, larger numbers might mean 40 people in each group. If you are doing population health, we're expecting tens of thousands of people in those types of um, studies. So this contrast with qualitative research, where the purpose is not to reflect the general population. So in those studies, you might see anywhere from five participants up to 20. So we get different scales of numbers. So other characteristics of samples or like who is part of this research study is what we mean by sample. The people who are in quantitative research studies are generally randomly selected. So you might go through a list of every nurse in the hospital and send an email to every fifth person on that list. So that way you're not picking people um, based on any of their personal characteristics, you're choosing randomly. So that you can say this group was randomly selected and from this group, um, then we're going to look at, um, you know, what we can, how we can apply this to a broader population. This again contrasts with qualitative research where we want people with specific experiences or specific perspectives. So we're not gonna just randomly pick people, we want people that have had a specific experience. So for example, we might, um, for a quantitative study, we might pick every fifth the nurse on the hospital employee list and contact them all to invite them into a study about the impact of um, a debriefing intervention after working during COVID. Alternatively, if we wanted to look at people who have taken medical leave as a result of having COVID while working as a nurse, then we would look specifically for people with those characteristics. So we generally want to make sure that the sample that we have is reflective of the broader population. So this doesn't mean that everybody in the sample is equal, that we have equal numbers of people who identify as men or women or gender diverse groups. It means that it reflects the population. So if you have a nursing study, you're gonna have a population that's 90% female. Um, that is true in every country of the world. And so when I see studies that say that, well, this population was largely female, therefore it might not apply, I get a little bit nervous because that doesn't reflect the fact that if your populate if your sample in a study is 90% female, well, so are all the other nursing samples that we're going to create in most cases. So then you could say this applies to other nurses, but if we're looking at other professional groups like physicians, where the gender distribution is different then we could say that this might not apply as, as directly. So, um, and that's not to negate the impact of including men and gender diverse people in studies of nurses. It's just that this is our current workforce demographic pattern. And so if we're doing things that look at, you know, the impact of interventions for nurses, this is generally what we're gonna see. <clears throat> 
So for the samples, we're looking for big numbers, randomly selected, and ideally they reflect the population. So maybe at our hospital, we have 20% um, of nurses are Indigenous. So in our sample, we would aim to have 20% of the participants in the research study are Indigenous. That way we try and get that correspondence with the broader group that we're going to try and extrapolate our findings to apply for a broader group. So shifting gears, we're gonna look now at more specific factors within um, quantitative research and the different types of designs you can have. And so research design refers to the mechanics that you try and use to answer your research question. So it is a plan to study your scientific problem or your question. And so you want to see, particularly with a quantitative study, you want a very clear plan and you know they want that they, you want to know that they had a clear plan from the beginning. It is very concerning if they had a make it up as you go plan, especially with quantitative research. So if we reflect back in quantitative research, we're often trying to control the context. And if your design changes, that indicates that the way you're controlling the context in your study is also changing. And the likelihood of getting good results that we can trust from that type of work is very, very small. So um, we want to see that there was a clear plan and they stuck to it. Now, if they said, you know, we had to pause our plan because of COVID-19 or because of flooding in this area, then, um, then that's different. But we can, you know, we can make allowances for things that are beyond people's control. But if they said, well, we tried to do this, but then it didn't work. So then we tried this, we start to get nervous. Um, it, so designs in general outline the basic strategies and you would expect to see certain things with each strategy. So you know that um, when we're talking about baseball, we have bases and runs and innings. When we're talking about ice hockey, we have um, periods and goals and games. And, you know, if we're talking about um, soccer or football in the European sense, well, we have pitches, we have matches, we have halves, we have, you know, so they're all sports but each one has kind of its own little flavor to it. So the goal in all of them is to play a sport for a period of time without excessively hurting other people and to increase the number of things that you have scored, but the way that they do it is different. So if you can kind of, that applies really nicely to looking at research designs because they all have similar characteristics, but they also have their own flavors as well. So in a broad overview of quantitative design, we have experimental, non-experimental. So non-experimental means we are measuring things the way they are. We are not trying to change something in that environment. We're not conducting an experiment. So we might be looking at the impact of things that happen organically, but we are not trying to create something by creating an input. Um, implementing an intervention. So we're just watching it unfold the way it would. We're not doing anything to manipulate the context. And I mean manipulate in like a value, values neutral type of way. Um, I'm not implying manipulative, but rather that we, we do something to create a change. In the experimental groups, we are doing something to create a change. And then we're looking at the impact of that change or Maybe we haven't done something, but something has happened and we're assessing the impact of what has happened. So um, yeah, non-experimental includes correlational and descriptive. I'll we'll talk about each of those in detail. And then experimental, we can have the randomized controlled trial, which is kind of the holy grail of quantitative research. So we'll talk about those and then quasi-experimental research as well. So thinking of our first set of categories, non-experimental designs. So we are observing, we are describing, we are looking at what naturally happens out in the world. We are not trying to change anyone's 
behavior based on our actions. So we are looking at variables and associations between variables rather than trying to create effect. So how might we do this? Things like sending people surveys, looking at the census, um, conducting interviews. Now interviews um, and observations. So we can talk to people, we can watch what happens in a given space. These specific techniques can be used in quantitative or qualitative research. So no particular research design owns the techniques that they use, but rather it's how do they conduct these techniques. So for example, in a qualitative study, an interview will have lots of open-ended questions. And you know, you just see how many times your, or you look at how your participant talks about things, what they bring up, what is important to them and go from there. Um, in contrast, if you're doing a quantitative interview, um, a classic example is the studies where um, Goffman looked at relationships and they said that you need to have five positive interactions for every one negative interaction to have a satisfying relationship with a romantic partner. So there they measured within partners speaking to each other, like how many positive interactions have they had versus how many negative interactions. So in both cases, you're using an interview as the tool, but you end up with like, are you quantifying the information in that interview or are you qualifying the inter information in that interview? So if you're counting something, you're into quantitative research. If you're looking at big ideas, then you're into qualitative research. So just to say, just because you see interviews doesn't automatically mean that your decision tree can branch <laughs> because these tools can be used in different ways. But non-experimental designs, we're looking at things that are naturally happening. Um, also with descriptive studies, we can look at whether it's retrospective or prospective. So retrospective, if you think of like retro, like, I don't know, disco or whatever, retro means past. So we're looking at what has happened. So something we might want to do is look at how um, patterns of use in the emergency department changed over the pandemic. So maybe we'll start, say, from um, January 1st, 2023, and look backward at, you know, 10 years of data about emergency room visits and see how frequently people visited the emergency room and for what medical concerns, and then how did that change over the course of the pandemic. A prospective study means going forward. So starting today, we are going to look at um, the impact that opening a new urgent care center has in the city and see if that changes the patterns of emergency department use in other places. So retrospective is we're looking at data that already exists and we're looking at um, patterns going backwards. Prospective is we're gonna create or gather new data um, and we're going to look at patterns going forward. So when we look at descriptive studies, they're the kind of one of the bread and butter ones. There's two we're going to talk about here, um, cross-sectional and longitudinal. So cross-sectional is one of the most common research designs and um, it, it is a oldie but a goodie, like it's a classic and it works well and it's easy to create really important and interesting findings with this. And it tends to be, you know, relatively faster and cheaper than other methods. So when we look at a cross-sectional study, we're looking at, if you think of like a cross-section, so a cross-section meaning you take a slice from something and then look at it under a microscope, that's essentially what we're doing here is we're taking a slice of the population and considering it with a particular phenomenon. So in nursing, the kind of the most prominent that I can think of, at least the most prominent research studies that have used cross-sectional design are Linda Aiken. So Linda Aiken is currently one of the greatest living nurse scientists because she was the one who 
led projects that definitively prove that nurses matter. And we all know this, we've known this our entire professional lives. However, she provided cross-sectional data that demonstrated the value of nursing. So for example, this is her 2002 study, and I know it's a little bit older, but this was an absolute watershed moment for modern nursing because she demonstrated by looking at the number of patients in the hospitals, the number of nurses in the hospitals, and the different characteristics of the hospitals. So their size, their teaching status, their use of technology. She looked across a whole lot of different countries and a whole lot of different units and everything else and found that after, I believe it's eight patients, every additional patient you add to a nurse's assignment creates an increased risk of death for all the patients or an increased risk of mortality by seven to eight percent. So this was a quantification that if you don't have enough nurses, patients are more likely to die. And this is incredibly important because we saw in the 90s um, globally, there was a lot of emphasis on kind of neoliberal um, approaches to healthcare. So let's cut down the number of staff. And, um, you know, in Canada, we saw Ralph Klein and Mike Harris both, I can say quite objectively, they both gutted the public um, healthcare systems in Alberta and Ontario to a degree that the staffing levels have never recovered. So um, this has I share that example to demonstrate this research has huge impact for policy decisions and also for the safety of, of patients and the care that they receive. So cross-sectional studies can provide extremely valuable information by looking at, you know, what's out there. When we look at how many nurses, how many patients we have in a space and contrast that with the outcomes, what do we find? So in cross-sectional studies, I'll also add Thinking back to our prior discussion, you can have nominal, ordinal, or ratio levels of measurement. So cross-sectional design is nice because you can have different levels of measurement included. So the other main type of descriptive designs is longitudinal. And so um, a longitudinal design looks at how something has changed over time. And so you follow a group of people and see how outcomes unfold over time. And when I say over time, you need more than two measurements. So if you only have two measurements, you're probably talking about what we would call a pre-test, post-test type of study. And that falls in experimental designs. So you need more than two for it to be longitudinal. So you might look at children who were born during the pandemic and follow them for years to see how, you know, decreased socialization in the first year of their lives, if that had any long-term consequences. So um, this is an, ex the example on the screen is about um, the impact of mental health and human service work. So what happens when we have nurses working in poor working conditions um, and other healthcare professionals as well. So they follow people for you know, a long time, and they found that poor working conditions over time mean that people's mental health deteriorates. So um, you can see a flavor to some of these studies. Basically, if you're in a bad working environment, get out. <laughs> so you can see that we've got, these are workforce studies. We can use a cross-sectional design. Here's an example of a longitudinal design, but they all feed into our understanding of um, you know, what kind of nursing staffing, what kind of workplace is, is safe for nurses and patients. So shifting from descriptive, we're still in the non-experimental designs, but we're shifting to correlation. And so correlation is two ratio level variables. And we're looking at, are these things associated? So one thing to note about a correlation, the statistical test, a positive correlation does not mean a positive value. It means that both variables move in the same direction. So if we think of baseline is zero, 
we say when we have increased mental health support, um, nurses do better. So both, when one goes up, the other goes up. However, if we cut the budget and we lose all our mental health support, when one goes down, the other goes down. So pardon my little dance I'm doing here, but you wanna say a positive correlation means that both go in the same direction. And that might be a negative number, but it's a positive correlation when both variables, when the measurements move in the same direction. So an increase in one is an increase in the other. It's a negative correlation when they have an inverse relationship. So when one variable goes up, the other variable goes down. So when we have increased opportunities for continuing professional development, nurse um, turnover or the number of nurses putting their jobs decreases. And if we decrease our professional development opportunities, the number of nurses who leave their jobs is gonna go up. So this is a negative correlation because the numbers move um, like a seesaw or a teeter-totter, or I don't think those words translate to everybody, but like a set of scales, we see them move in opposite directions. So the most important thing about correlation is correlation does not equal causation. So just because two things are correlated, as in when we measure one, we can get a pretty predictable outcome in the other one, and they might move the same direction or they might move in inverse directions, that does not mean that one causes the other, okay? And when I see people who are spreading this information online, this is the most classic trick is saying that because two things are correlated means that one causes the other. So we look at correlation means two things are associated, but we cannot definitively say because of one, the other one happens. So there's lots of examples online of like funny correlations. So I think there was one that meant that like an increase in um, elephant poop among elephants in um, Southeast Asia correlates positively with the quality of the orange harvest in Florida. You know, so those two things are like completely, the likelihood of them being directly connected is very, very small but they do correlate. So somebody could come out with a theory there, but you don't have the background behind it to actually justify that sort of scientific conclusion. So that's why the, the discussion behind your hypothesis and your variables and how you set up your research, that all really matters. We can also see correlations like um, studies where we know that the amount of organic produce that's consumed correlates with rates of autism in a population. So does that mean that people, increasing amounts of autism mean more people eat organic food? Does it mean that increased amounts of organic food mean more people have autism? No, it means neither of those things. It just means that we have more diagnoses of autism now, and we also have higher rates of people eating organic food. So that is a classic place where people spreading misinformation will try and mix that up into one thing causes another. But you have to be very careful because that's not what these studies tell us. They do give us valuable information, but we can't definitively say A causes B with this type of research. So, oops, sorry. So a correlational study, here we have the number of nurses on a unit and we look at the number of pressure ulcers. And so this is a case where we're not trying to control the context. It is unethical for us to short staff an area or to give people a pressure ulcer or to make them stay in bed and not ambulate and eat poorly and not be on an inflating mattress and they end up with a pressure ulcer. So we're not trying to intervene in this context because that could be unethical. Rather, what we're looking at is the natural changes in nursing staffing and whether or not, or like the rates of pressure ulcers in that area. 
So this is a place where nursing staffing is a ratio level variable. We can have three nurses, four nurses, five nurses. There's, so there's a precise numeric measurement that each value is the same increment more than the one before. Same with the number of pressure ulcers. We could have one, two, three. And so because we have two ratio level variables, we can look to see if they're correlated. And indeed they are. Um, this is a negative correlation, meaning the variables go in opposite directions. So when we have fewer nurses, we have more pressure ulcers. When we have more nurses, we have fewer pressure ulcers. So this is a great example of something that can inform nursing care in a clinical setting, where from this, we could then create, you know, um, intervention studies where we do experiments to see, okay, if we always overstaff by one nurse, does that decrease the pressure ulcers um, for patients? But this also gives us an indication that, okay, if we if we're having a high number of pressure ulcers in an area, maybe we'll want to think about what does our staffing look like? Is the staffing adequate? So that's how a correlational study can apply to our practice or our workforce decisions when we're looking at how we provide nursing care. So we've got descriptive studies. And that includes longitudinal and cross-sectional. And then we have correlational studies. And the main difference between all of those is that we use different levels of measurement. So nominal, ordinal, or ratio level variables applied in different ways. Now we're gonna jump to the other column. We're talking about experimental designs. So this is where we are directly doing something, we are creating some disruption in an environment to see if we can produce a given effect. And so this is considered, you'll often see written that a randomized controlled trial is a gold standard of highest level of evidence because we can definitively prove that A causes B. So when we say a randomized controlled trial, breaking that down, randomized means that we have at least two groups of people and we have, say we've recruited 100 participants, we stick 50 in one group and 50 in the other group and it happens in a randomized fashion. So if we wanted to look at increasing muscle mass after a hospital admission, if we put our 50, we're all big strong people who had done bodybuilding in the past, and then 50 were, um, you know, people that had never lifted weights in their life, then we're, our study isn't randomized because we kind of deliberately skewed the results by where we put people. So to truly have a randomized study, we have two groups or more, and the likelihood of you being put in one group or the other is equal. So when we say controlled trial, it means that we have controlled the context in which the trial occurs. And the trial, in, the word trial indicates we are conducting an experiment and we are trialing or testing something to see what outcomes we have. So um, because of all of the groups are random, we are controlling the context and we're testing an intervention, that together means that we can definitively establish causation if everything, if the trial is well conducted and everything goes well. Um, so randomized control trials might be blinded or unblinded. You might hear, hear like a double blind randomized control trial is considered like oh, the very best. So when we're talking about blinded, we mean that do the people doing the statistical analysis know what group someone was in. So did they get, if they were in a group that got regular care or a group that got a new medication, do the people evaluating the outcomes know which group the participants were in? Um, so if they knew, they might say, oh, well, this result didn't work so well, so we're gonna hide that one. And that might sound really silly if you're first coming to these topics, but people do that all the time to try and inflate the quality of their science, which is problematic, but that's, that's the ethics lecture. Um, so when it's double-blinded, so the people who are doing the research are blind, they don't know who is in what group, and the patients, participants, the people receiving the research are also blind. 
So they don't know if they're getting a medication or not. There's a bag hanging there intravenously. It might be saline. It might be a new medication. And they're getting that. And we don't, we don't know. The people evaluating the study don't know. And the people receiving the treatment don't know. Now, somewhere, someone along the line has to know because they are the one that puts the medication in the intravenous bag and labels it and keeps track. But that that group is separate and does not impact the analysis or um, whether people are, whether the participants or whether the, um, the scientists, like they don't, there's no connection between those. So that information doesn't get leaked essentially. Now, you can have a double-blind double blind randomized control trial. However, there's lots of cases where this sort of like, you know, holy grail of research does not apply. So if you are doing an intervention where you're asking nurses to do yoga for 30 minutes after every one of their shifts, you cannot have a double-blind trial because the nurses have to know, do I go to yoga class after my shift or do I not go to yoga class? So there you would have a single blinded in that the people doing the analysis wouldn't know if based on you know, your survey responses, did you go to yoga or not? But the participants do have to know. Um, there's also, yeah, there's a lot of controversy around these. I mean, some people believe that they're the only kind of useful science. Um, I am not in that camp. And there's lots of critiques of randomized control trials. So I posted one here, uh, for example, parachute use to prevent death and major trauma when jumping from airplanes. And um, of course, this study is like lighthearted. They did not actually do this, but you can imagine asking somebody to jump out of an airplane with a backpack and they may have a backpack with a parachute or they may have a backpack that has placebo that has nothing in it. And like that would be wildly unethical. And also that goes to show that we don't need a randomized control trial to answer every question. We know that somebody jumping out of an airplane needs a parachute. Like that is a given. And so in that case, a randomized control trial doesn't make any sense. So this is, study is kind of a lighthearted way to say there are times where, particularly if we're testing medication or novel treatments, this is the way to go research-wise. But there's also times where this is not necessary. So you can also see that if you have a group of investigators, you've got a group of people who are implementing the trial, you have a group of participants, then you also have what's called the controlled group, which is the group where we're comparing the results, um, then that is a lot of work. <laughs> Even without knowing the details of how to do research, you can tell that is a lot of work. These studies are hugely labor intensive, they're very expensive, and they require a huge amount of resources. And that's just not always feasible. So if we can do this and it makes sense, like we're testing a new medication, absolutely, this is great. However, there's lots of other valid ways of answering research questions and creating good evidence to use in practice. So when you come across in the textbooks that you will read that says RCTs are kind of the only way to go, I want you to approach that with a healthy amount of skepticism because there's lots of ways that we can answer questions that can improve the experiences for nurses and patients. So this is an example of a randomized control trial. So in this group, um, it says it's a multi-arm trial. So they have three different groups. Um, so we're looking at um, caring for preterm infants in neonatal ICU. So in one group, they played the mother's voice to the infant four times a day. In the second group, they played white noise to the infant four times a day. In the third case, they did not play any additional sounds. It was just the regular sounds from ICU. Um, and they compared the scores of those infants across a variety of measures. So did they have decreased cortisol rates or like decreased stress? Um, did they have different weight gain and that kind of thing? And this is important because we know that these 
these patients are very, very fragile. And also they can't tell us, oh, hearing my mom's voice was so soothing. So we have to look at other ways like heart rate, like cortisol levels, like weight gain that we can measure. Is this having a positive outcome? So this is a great example because we've got three different groups and we're comparing the outcomes based on how we controlled the context. And in this case, the context is the noise that preterm infants experienced. And um, apologies to all the moms out there, but actually white noise was the one that helped the, um, the infants to gain more weight. And mother's voices actually didn't have an impact across any of the measures. Mother's voices were the same as um, regular care. Now, that does not mean that having a mother at the bedside in an NICU is not valuable. But if we're looking at, can we play sounds, you know, parents can't be at the bedside forever. They have to go sleep, they have to go shower. So maybe when they're not there, we could play some white noise because that might decrease the beeping and the the honking and all the general sounds that happen, the voices, everything that happens in ICU all the time. So anyway, this is an example of a randomized control trial and one that could have direct impact on how we provide care. So our last design that we're gonna talk about, this is the quasi-experimental design. So quasi-experimental designs happen when Ex regular experimental research is unethical or impractical. So if we're looking at the outcomes of um, giving, if we're looking at, you know, the outcomes of a group of infants that um, were exposed to COVID-19 versus infants that were not, well, we cannot give an infant COVID-19. That is unethical. Or if we're comparing something like mothers who consumed alcohol during pregnancy, or I should say pregnancy capable people who consumed alcohol during pregnancy compared to um, people who did not consume alcohol during pregnancy. I can't tell a group of people, okay, we want you to drink alcohol during your pregnancy. Like that is unethical, it's impractical. We cannot do things like that. However, we can use quasi-experimental designs. So this is where we do not do the intervention, but we can look at the impact of intervention. So if we find out that a pregnancy-capable person has consumed alcohol during pregnancy, then we can compare maybe their child's developmental scores with another group of um, pregnancy-capable people that did not consume alcohol during pregnancy. So when we do that, we are doing what's called quasi-experimental. So the randomized control trial, we are randomizing people to different groups. Quasi-experimental, the groups are naturally occurring and we are not making people go into one group or another. Um, we can also, you know, there, there are cases like where things are quite unethical, but it also might be impractical. So we could, ex we could um, explore outcomes comparing Foothills Hospital gets Connect Care or maybe get digital charting before um, the Royal Alexandra Hospital does. And so we'll compare the outcomes between those two groups because there's no way that we could feasibly say, okay, the nurse is on, half the nurses on day shift are gonna use electronic charting and half the nurses on day shift are gonna use paper charting. Like that would just be a fiasco, but we could say, okay, this entire building in Calgary is gonna do electronic charting. This entire building in Edmonton is going to do paper charting. And that way we're also unlikely to get what we would call contamination. Um, I appreciate that has a kind of, a, that word has a negative, connotation to it and it kind of comes from the legacy of like research and petri dishes and things we don't want them to get contaminated but it is applied to um, science with humans as well so when we say contamination in that context what we're talking about is the nurses at the royal alexandra hospital are unlikely to also work at the foothills hospital and they are also unlikely to you know, talk to each other or go back and forth because those hospitals are a three hour drive apart. So we're 
likely to prevent contamination um, from going back and forth. If we looked at hospitals that were, say, across the road from each other, maybe one is a pediatric hospital and the other one is an adult hospital, well, it's more conceivable that you could have nurses that maybe work casual at both places. And so they'd be going back and forth for different shifts, which might mean that your experimental design, you're not able to control the context in the same way. So that's why your comparison or your control group might be a whole other site. It might be another country. Um, it might be another group of people that you, you know, you can somehow segregate, and I use the word segregate in a very ethically neutral term here, but just to say you can keep one group, your experimental group away from your control group so that you don't get that um, crossover happening. So some of these things, you can see the legacy and the terminology of this descends a lot from natural sciences, where we're talking about, you know, keeping samples in one temperature environment with X amount of humidity versus a different temperature environment and Y amount of humidity. So when we've got things like that, you can see that we have um, different approaches. But with human science, I mean, it doesn't, things like contamination don't apply as nicely, but this is some of the language you're gonna see because a lot of this work descended from the natural sciences. So types of quasi-experimental designs. So here's one where they, um, this example, they looked at the cognition, sleepiness, and different domains of performance between nurses doing three 12-hour day shifts versus three 12-hour night shifts. So these nurses were going to work their scheduled shifts regardless. So um, they were going to be in one of these two groups, they're working anyway. And what these researchers did was assess these different characteristics across the um, uh, across this series of shifts and then compared day shift, nurses working day shift with nurses working night shift. So they found that nurses maintain performance across their shifts. So their cognition, um, you know, they, they stay strong across the set of three shifts. The one thing they found that deteriorated was communication, particularly on night shift. So if you are at hour 10 of a 12 hour night shift and you've done three in a row and somebody is um, it's not okay that they're yelling at you, but they're maybe a little short with you, well then, that is maybe a product of <laughs> the context and not so much about you. So you can see that there's a communication or a deterioration in communication styles, but otherwise people are still engaging in strong critical thinking and that's really important. So we know that based on our shift pattern, our patients as safe with nurses doing one type of shift pattern versus another. So this is an example of quasi-experimental design. Um, so that brings us to the end of, so we think back, we've got um, experimental, non-experimental. In our non-experimental, we have descriptive, which includes longitudinal and cross-sectional and correlational studies. Then in our experimental, we have randomized controlled trials, which could be blinded or double blind, single blind, unblinded, or we can have quasi-experimental studies where we are looking at an intervention, but we are not necessarily creating and controlling that intervention. So those are the main food groups within um, quantitative research designs. So very quickly, I'm gonna look at when you are critically appraising these, what are you looking for? Um, I think that the, so there's lots of different segments of appraisal when you're looking through an article. Is this good research? Is this not good research? I would say the main things that you want to look at for a quantitative paper is if they've done an experiment, was that experiment ethical? Um, because ethics is still one of the biggest places where, um, where quantitative designs can fall down. Even more, so there's lots of, in my ethics videos, I've talked about how there's a legacy of bad research. Even more currently, um, we have studies where people were assessing the impact of, say, 
methadone programs to help support people with addictions. And they found that actually giving people placebo rather than methadone um, caused an increase in deaths. So that was really awful. And now within addictions research, it's known that you cannot just give someone something, like tell them they have to be sober without, um, or tell them that they have to stop consuming substances, cold turkey, and not give any any type of medic medication for relief um, because the outcomes were so negative. Um, there were also trials where they tried to pay people not to take drugs and like that ended very badly as well. So instead, now we know that if you're looking at testing addiction treatment, well, you have to give normal treatment plus perhaps enhanced treatment. You can't just say no treatment versus treatment. So is the study ethical? Was it okay to do an experiment? If they did an experiment where people randomly assigned to different groups and were those groups relatively equal at the start? So we didn't have all the bodybuilders in one group and all the um, people who had never lifted weights in the other. Are the groups random and can we see at the beginning of the experiment that they were both relatively equal? You're probably in the studies with humans, you're not going to get perfectly equal, but were they fairly close? Um, the other thing to look for for any type of quantitative design is have they reported all of their data? If they said they did a test, is there a table that shows that that test was done and they've shared all of the statistics from that test? Um, that way, there are some people that when they read research papers, they only read the results section because they just look for themselves what statistics are here and what do those statistics say. Um, that is good for experts in a field, for the rest of us. Um, it's important to look across the paper. How, how are the hypotheses stated? Did the statistical tests they used, did they actually test those hypotheses or did they test something else? Um, and then, do all of the parts of the study, I like to say, do they all rhyme or do they all fit nicely together? If you have something that says we wanted to study happiness, but then they measured income, you might think, well, a happiness and income might be related, but you cannot directly associate one by measuring the other. So then you get into um, challenges with that. One other consideration to flag is, are the limitations discussed? There is no such thing as research with no limitations. Every research study, you have to make compromises to get the work done because we don't exist in a vacuum and there's time and resource pressures, there's political context. You know, the ideal might be that we study children for eight hours a day every week, or an eight hour day once a week, every week of their childhood. That is extremely difficult to do and would put way too much burden on the children and their families. So instead we might check in with children every four months or every six months and do that across the first five years of life. So you wanna say, yeah, there might be a way that we could have done this that would have been limitation free, but it's probably not feasible. So based on the limitations that are part of this study, are they reasonable? And we can say, yeah, that's not perfect, but we can still learn from this. Or are they limitations um, that are really concerning? So based on that, we can make the assessment, is this study any good? And then from there, based on that, should I apply this study in my practice? Or should I bring this study forward as something we could be using in, in practice generally in this setting? So hopefully this is helpful, introduction to quantitative designs. And then next week, we're gonna talk about qualitative designs and that contrast can help you see, hopefully that there's lots of different ways to answer a question. Um, one way is not better than the other. It's just a question of what is the best fit for what I can do now and what will give me answers that I can use to positively impact my practice environment. So thank you very much.